So uh, today is Easter, and my guess is that a lot of people, a lot of you, know the Easter story. The Bible talks about the Easter story four times. Uh, there's four biographies of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and each of them tell a very similar story. And the reason I use the word similar is because they're not all the same. And I think that bothers us as Americans, as Westerners, because we love to get details and we want verifiable proof and stuff like that. But the truth is, when it comes to, when it comes to um, the way that the Jewish culture told stories 2,000 years ago, they weren't interested in showing you video footage of what happened. They were more interested in painting a picture for you. So if you look at paintings, like the old paintings, or even paintings that you've probably done, if you guys do that kind of stuff, um, what you do is you accentuate certain parts of the painting because you want people to draw their eyes to a certain part of the, of the portrait. Does that, does that make sense? Right? So we look at like Washington uh, crossing the Delaware River, and you look at that and say, did this really happen? Did it exactly look, that, like, like, look like that? Were they really in that pose? Were that, that many people in that boat? Right? These are the questions we ask, but the painter is like, the accuracy of this painting is not the point of this painting. The point of this painting is that, look, look at them, they look so courageous. Look at the waves, look at the dark sky, look at this, look at that. And they're trying to not just tell you what happened, because it did happen, but they're trying to tell you, this is what I think is the importance of that story. And so it was very common, it's not just these four writers who wrote about Jesus' death and resurrection, because that happened, but they accentuated certain parts of the story to make sure that you guys understood, that we understood what the point of this, this story was. And as it turns out, these four biographers, these four guys, they accentuate different parts of the story. And so we all know the basic story. Jesus died on Good Friday, and then three days later, Jesus rose from the grave. I mean, that's the basic story. So when we look at each of these gospel writers and say, well, how, what part of the story are they accentuating? Well, today I want to show you what John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the fourth biography of Jesus, what he accentuated. And as a matter of fact, he puts in some detail in this story that's not mentioned in the other stories. And there's a reason for that. Okay, and because there's this really weird passage in the book of John that if you've read through the book of John, you'll be like, oh, I've seen that before, but I've never really given it much thought. Or I thought it was weird that he put that in there, but yeah, I never really thought what the significance of that was. So I want to share with you that weird verse that's in the book of John. This is the story of when Jesus is hanging on the cross. This is how it goes. Because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, we'll talk about that in a second, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. So what he's saying here is this. In the Jewish culture, the Sabbath, that's Saturday, was a very holy day. And they did not allow any dead bodies hanging from any kind of piece of wood on the Sabbath. And this was Friday. Jesus was hanging on the cross on Friday. And in that culture, the day begins at sunset. So as the sun goes down, it's already Saturday. And Jesus is hanging on the cross around 3 p.m. So the Jews in that culture, in that time, were like freaking out like uh, Romans. You have three hours to take down that body because uh, we, don't, you know, we don't allow this kind of stuff to happen on the, sa on the Sabbath. The Romans, on the other hand, are like, we want to instill fear in our people, the people who are living here in Jerusalem. So um, we want to let, let everybody know that we're, we're serious about killing you. So what do they do? They're like, well, we got to expedite this whole death sentence thing. So people hang on the cross, they break their legs because their legs bear most of the weight of hanging on the cross. And now when your legs are broken, your arms, your hands where the nails are pierced, that's what's holding your weight now. And every time you wanna breathe, you have to pull yourself up and just take a gulp of air and bring yourself down because it's just exhausting. And people on the cross usually die because of exhaustion and suffocation. And so they're like, let's break their legs so that we could make this thing go faster. So that's what they do. Next verse. The soldiers, therefore, came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus and then those of the other. So the guy on the left, guy on the right of Jesus, their legs were broken and they, they suffocate and they die. Well, let's see what happens to Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. How do you know he was dead? I mean, maybe he's faking it. Maybe he fell asleep. Maybe he's too tired to keep his eyes open. Well, they know he's dead because of what they did next. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side, doesn't say which side, but it's just the side, 
with a spear bringing a sudden flow of blood, which is normal. When you stab somebody in the side, they bleed. But then John adds this extra detail at the end of this verse that makes you kind of scratch your head like, really, that happened, John? Because there was blood that came out and also water. Water. Now, for the past 200 years or so, Americans, and it's always the, us you know, that care about the details and like, want to see how this could really happen, they've done some medical studies on people to say, like, well, is this really possible? And they're like, yeah, actually it is. When you're under a lot of stress, there's a sack around your heart that starts to get filled with water to protect it. And maybe when the guard stabbed Jesus through the side and it went all the way up to his heart, maybe it broke that sack and the water poured out. Maybe that's what happened. Or there's another explanation that says once you die, your body stops producing blood and then your fluid, your clear fluid and your blood, it starts to separate from each other, right? And so maybe that's what poured out, the clear liquid. And you know, like this is just so typically us that we want a scientific explanation to verify what happened in the Bible, right? And that's, it's understandable, right? Well, here's a scholar, my favorite scholar, N.T. Wright. This is what he says about this. He says, after death, the body fluids separate out. The medical details have been interpreted in different ways. Like there's different interpretations of how this could really happen scientifically. Then he says this, and a living body would have produced blood, a dead body from somewhere in the chest or stomach would produce a mixture of clotting blood and a watery substance. So he's like, yeah, I know there's scientific evidence for this kind of stuff. Yes, you know, doctors have testified saying, yeah, this could really happen, right? But he's like, you're missing the point if this is where you end up. He says, John, the writer, has left us in no doubt, like all scholars agree, that that's not the point. That all these details, though from one point of view accidental, that like, yeah, sure it could happen. You know, he probably poked in a random place on the side and water poured out. Sure, that could happen. But, you know, we're all to be seen as a heaven sent signs. It's a sign of what it all meant. He's like, there's a reason why John included this detail, and it wasn't to prove to everybody that you could prove this scientifically. Or He's like, that's not the point of why this detail is in there. He's saying that this is actually a sign. There is a point to all this. Well, wh wh what is it? I mean, the question I want to answer today is this. What was John trying to tell us when he wrote that water was flowing from Jesus' side? Because there is a significant reason for this. So for us to understand this, because we know that John was a Hebrew boy, he was, he was about, he was probably like 13 or 14 when this actually happened before his eyes, okay? And when he wrote this, he was like in late into his 40s or 50s. But when he wrote this, he was like, oh, I'm a Jewish boy, and so I understand the Old Testament. I've been reading the Bible my whole life, and so because of this, I, I, I have to tell you, like, John's like, I've read the other biographies, the book of John was written last, He's like, I read the other biographies, and I have to say, I have to include this part in my biography, my version of this story, because there's such significant significance in this water imagery. So what is this water all about? Well, let's talk about water for a second. In the Hebrew mind, water, well, there's two types of waters. The first kind of water, some call it, scholars would call it, they call it the chaotic waters. Chaotic waters are basically salty water, the kind of water you find in the ocean. It can't bring life to plants or to people, right? Um, the Old Testament starts with chaotic waters. Um, the reason why they call it chaotic waters is because people die, like a flood would be considered chaotic waters. Um, people drowning in the ocean, that's chaotic waters. People sink in their boats in chaotic waters. Uh, they've seen villages get washed away because of these chaotic waters. So Genesis 1, okay, in the very beginning of the Bible, there's a, something called a creation poem, okay? And this, in this poetry, the story starts with chaotic waters, and then the Spirit of God hovers over the chaotic waters, and all of a sudden, the waters, they start to move. They start to separate. It says, on the first day, God said, let there be light, right? And there was the Spirit of God that hovered over the waters, and all of a sudden, the waters started to separate. The water from the sky, the water from the ground, they separated, and the, and the next day, the water separated from the land, from the waters. Like, as God is starting to bring His Spirit into the chaotic waters, the water becomes more and more ordered, and then we have something called the water of life. The water of life is the other category of water in the Bible, and they believe that, and some people call it living waters, um, the water of life is the, is the kind of water that brings life. 
the kind that you drink, the thing that makes trees grow. This is the kind of water that he's talking about. And so, and I don't know if you guys know this, but Genesis chapter 1 is the creation poem. But did you know that there's a second creation story in the Bible? It's found in the very next chapter, page 2 of Genesis. And in this version of the story, the world is not start, it does not start with chaotic waters. It starts with a desert. In the middle of that desert, God plants a tree. And we call that the tree of life. And in that, from that tree of life, this, this living water starts to pour out of it. And now we have a garden, a garden of Eden. And Adam and Eve are placed in that garden. And this is how it's described for us in uh, Genesis chapter 2. Now, no shrubs had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant had yet sprung up. But streams, so we have water here, streams uh, came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. So you're, you're just try to imagine, there's a place that's completely arid, nothing there. And then all of a sudden, God plants a tree, and then there's water that starts flowing from it. And oh, by the way, if you guys were to think like, oh, I wonder what the Garden of Eden looked like. You would probably, and I'm guessing here, okay, and if you don't think this, I apologize, but you're probably thinking like a big area, probably the size of the school ground, right? And it's covered with, with trees and, and bushes and maybe some weeds, I don't know, flowers, um, orange trees, I don't know, right? Like, that's what we were thinking, but that's not the image that the, this, whoever wrote this is trying to convey to us. The Garden of Eden is actually a mountain. And you'll find that throughout the Bible, that people refer to the Garden of Eden as a hill or a mountain. And at the top of the mountain, in the center of the garden, is the tree of life. And the river is flowing downhill into the rest of the world. And wherever the water touches, there's life. Next verse, it goes like this. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground because of the water. Trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. It's sustainable. People are living Animals are alive, trees are growing because of this water. And then in the middle of that garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So there's two trees, one huge beautiful tree that gives you life, the spring of living water is pouring out of there, and then there's this other tree, okay? Now, what happens to this water? Well, a river, water in the garden flow from Eden, and from there, it was separated into four headwaters. And so these four streams, these four rivers, they go out to the world and it gives life to the rest of the world. And this is the image that they're trying to paint here, that this water is, is precious. Without this water, there would be no life. So there's chaotic waters that brings death and destruction. By the way, baptism is chaotic waters because the symbol there is that you go underwater, you die to your old self, you come back up, and now you have life but we're not gonna talk about chaotic waters today. We're talking about the living water. Living water gives us life, gives everything life. But as you, if you guys read through the Bible, at least through the first three few chapters, in chapter three of Genesis, humanity looks at, they're living at the source of living water, and they're like really happy. They're walking with God, they have everything they could ask for. And then a serpent shows up and says, no, you're not really satisfied, are you? There's more that you could have, way more. And they're like, no, 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 this water is enough for us. What are you talking about? Because this water, this water that God's providing for us, God's water flowed to the rest of the world and it gave it life. Like, what more can we ask for? But the serpent's like, no, you can have more. As a matter of fact, God's holding out on you. You could have, you could have more control over this world. Right now, you have control of the garden, you know, over the animals, but you can have control over more things. Don't you want that? And so by the, by the middle of chapter three, they're convinced that they need more security, they need more control, and they want more power. And the serpent says, do you know how you could get those three things? It's like, no, please tell us. Can't believe we're talking to a snake, but yeah, we, we'll, we trust every word you say, snake. What do you want, uh, what do we have to do? Well, what you need more of is you need more wisdom. And the more wisdom that you have on your own terms, not on God's terms, but on your own terms, then you'll be able to have more security, more control, and more power. And so they start chasing after these things. And what they thought was satisfying is no longer satisfying to them. Whatever they had was not enough for them. So they keep chasing after things that they thought that they wanted more of. And you know where it led them? It led them outside the garden. They were banished, and the stream of living water stopped flowing. And that's how the Bible starts their story. So, what happens to humanity at that point? 
Did God give up on them? Well, as it turns out, no. Even though the, the, the living water stopped flowing from the garden, and for the rest of the Bible, humanity are just looking for things that would satisfy. If I just had more of that, if, just had, if I had more of that, then I'd be more happy, I'd be more fulfilled, I'd be more satisfied, right? I mean, think about war. I'm fighting because I want more of this. It's because I don't have enough resources for that, right? And so this is what the rest of the Old Testament and parts of the New Testament paint for us, is this image of humanity wanting more, trying to achieve it, and realizing it's not enough for them. And so as they go out to the desert in this arid world, you know, so it's also it's, it's physically thirsty, but they're also, like, their soul is thirsty. They're looking things for that that would satisfy. And because of that, humanity starts fighting against each other. And as they do that, they, they hurt one another. And here's an example story of it. There's a story, story about these two characters named Hagar and Ishmael. So this story pops up in the book of Genesis. There's a character named Abraham. Abraham is God's chosen person. And God looks at Abraham and says, hey, this world is a mess. And you know what? I'm going to use you and your descendants to fix this world. You are my chosen people. So Abraham and his wife are like, his, her name is Sarah. Okay, we're going to have a lot of kids. You know, <laughs> we're going to do that. But in their old age, they still didn't have any kids. So Sarah, out of desperation, because there's that thirst inside of her, says, okay, I'm so desperate that we're going to make this work. I have a servant. Her name is Hagar. We got her from Egypt. And what we're going to do is we're going to, she's basically my property. So if my husband and her get together and have a kid, technically it's probably my child, right? I don't know. Is that how God works? Let's give it a try. Abraham is like, okay. And so, you know, so she allows Hagar to be with her husband and they have a child named Ishmael. And then a few years later after that, Sarah gets pregnant and they have their own child, Isaac. Now Sarah is like, you know that first idea wasn't such a good idea? Um, she's a little jealous. So what does she do? She kicks out Hagar and Ishmael into the desert. And as they're wandering around the desert, Hagar and Ishmael, they're like, I think we're going to die out here. I, I, you know what? We should start prepping our hearts for death. And as they are getting ready to die, God provides a fountain. And this water gives them life. This, this living water that God gives them is in their desperation for life, God gives it to them and gives them life. So we see hints of God saying, even though the water is not flowing from Eden anymore, I will bring living water to you in these dire moments. Another story is about this servant of Abraham and this girl named Rebecca. Abraham now has Isaac as his son, right? And he's like, okay, good. We have one child, but you know, God said he's going to fix the world through our descendants. Isaac needs to get married and have kids. Right? And they're like, we, but, but we're so secluded. There's no way we could find anybody. And so he's like, servant, I want you to go off on this journey and find my son a wife. And as he's traveling, de desperate, looking for an heir, right? Somebody that could give him an heir. The servant comes to a well. And there's water there, living water. And as he's drinking the water, he, by the well, he meets a woman by the name of Rebecca. So when they were desperate, because they're thirsty, when they're desperate for an heir, God gives them living water. Another story, we have a story of a person named Moses in the book of Exodus. He was a prince of Egypt, but he was adopted as, as royalty. He's actually a Jew. And one day he's walking around Egypt and he sees that his own people are being beat down. So out of anger, he takes the Egyptian guard and kills him and buries his body and he goes, he's a fugitive. He runs away into the desert and now he's thirsty. And you know what he's desperate for because he's thirsty? He's desperate for a second chance at life. And you know what happens at that point? God brings him to a well. And when he's there, he meets a woman by the name of Zipporah who becomes his wife. And he is now adopted into this new tribe where he gains a lot of confidence, a lot of healing, and he's able to go back into Egypt and free the rest of the slaves. In his desperate moment for a second chance, he's given living water. Another story, once it's called Israelites and the rock. Once he pulls the Egyptians, uh, once he pulls uh, all of the slaves out of Egypt into the desert for a second chance at life, they're like, uh, we're in the desert, Moses. We need some water. And God's like, okay, go over to that big rock. I want you to strike it with your staff. And when you strike that staff, 
water, clean water will start pouring out and you guys will be given life. So as you can see throughout the Bible, even though they were separated from the source of living water, God gave cameo appearances of living water here and there in their times of desperation. You want a new, new start? Living water. So that's the story of living waters in the Old Testament. We see example after example, like when you need a new start, God's like, here's living water. When, when, you're, when you're in need of hope, here's living water. You, you want a second chance at life, here's living water. You're wondering what, what your future, your legacy is going to be, here's living water. But the problem is this. There's small pockets of living water that's popping up and people are like, well, why doesn't it pop up for me? <laughs> like, I'm desperate, I'm thirsty, where's my living water? And so over time, throughout the Old Testament, people are asking, will there ever be a permanent flow of this living water? Because it seems like it only pops up here and there. And then comes this prophet. His name is Ezekiel. Ezekiel shows up and he's trying to answer that very question. Is there ever going to be dry, uh, living water again? Because we're all thirsty. We're doing things out of desperation to a point where the chosen people of God are acting irrational. Like we need this living water and we need a permanent source. God, can you help me? And while he's praying that prayer and asking God, God sends him a vision. And in this vision, very interesting vision, I know Ezekiel is not a fun book to read, but when you get to the latter parts of the book, it gets really interesting. He has this vision where an angel is speaking to him, right? And so he takes him to this place in this vision of this desert. And he sees all these bones on the ground, dry bones. And this is a question that this angel asks him. Son of man, that's the nickname he had for Ezekiel. Son of man, can these bones live? To which Ezekiel's like, I, uh, his answer is this. Well, you know, <laughs> right? He's like, I don't want to answer that question. You answer it. Well, you know. And as he starts having this conversation with them, he looks at the bones and the scriptures say that the bones started rattling, started shaking. And then they started coming together and the tendons started attaching to them and the flesh started wrapping around it and it was given skin and then God breathed his spirit into these bodies and these dry bones became a living being. And, and Ezekiel's like, wait a minute, what are you telling me, God? I mean, this is all imagery, right? It's like, what are you trying to tell me? Like, are you telling me that the time of dryness is coming to an end? That you're going to be giving us life? Like, w when is that going to happen? Please tell me. Or how is it going to happen? Uh, how can I play a part in bringing that living water, like a permanent source of living water to us? And in this vision, God gives him a tour guide. And this tour, this tour guide takes Ezekiel to a temple a future temple that wasn't built yet. And he's like, let me give you a tour. And this tour takes about seven chapters. Like he's like showing you like, look at this wall, look at this building, look at this. And at the end of this very tour, he comes back to the front gate of the temple, right? And this is what he sees. This is the exciting part of this. Okay, here it goes. The man brought me, the tour guide, brought me back to the entrance to the temple. And I saw water coming out from under the threshold of the temple and a big airplane that flew over it. <laughs> okay, so Ezekiel is standing in front of the temple and he's looking and he's like, hey, I didn't see that before. Is that water coming out from the bottom of the temple? And then, you know, the guy's like grinning, he's like, oh, why, yes, yes it is. And then as he's staring at it, this is what Ezekiel witnessed, okay? He's like, what I see is that there's this little trickle coming from the side of the temple and it's flowing down the river, flowing down and it's just like a little stream right now. And as he's staring at it, he's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's more water coming out. It's, it's ankle deep now. And then the next verse, he's like, wait a minute. It's, 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 it's knee deep now. He's like, I could walk in it. And then after that, he's like, it's waist deep. Oh, man, this is crazy. And then he's like, is it going to spew out more water? Yes, next verse. Then it became a river. Now it was a river that I could not cross because the water has risen and was deep enough to swim in a river that no one could cross. It's like, it's so deep now that I could swim in it. Oh wait, I take that back. I can't cross this river because it is just so crazy. We're talking about like Nile River width. Okay, this is, he's like, in this vision, he sees this little trickle that turns into like, you know, a pore and then it goes up all the way up to his waist. And he's like, this is just crazy. This is, wow. So what are you telling me? What are you telling me? So the tour guide, he asks him a question. He says, son of man, do you see this? To which he says like, yeah, I could totally see it. I'm drowning in it. Then he led me back to the bank of the river. And at, when he's looking at this, he's like, now I'm seeing other things in this vision. He says, I saw a great number of trees on each side of the river. Like, wow, this isn't just a river. 
It's actually giving life to, to plants. It's, there's trees. And then he said to me, swarms of living creatures will live wherever the river flows. And in his mind, he's thinking, this is just like the Garden of Eden. Next verse. There will be large numbers of fish because this water flows there and makes the salt water fresh. It's not chaotic waters. This is, this is actually making the chaotic waters into living water. So where the river flows, everything will live. And so he's really excited about this. Like, oh, I can't wait to write this down and put it in the Bible one day. And then he says, fruit trees of all kinds will grow on both banks of the river. Their leaves will not wither, nor will their fruits fail. Because back in those days, a lot of fruit trees didn't make it to bear fruit. And if it did, it would only be there for a season because no fruit tree is year-round, right? Or maybe it is. I just don't know of any. But in this one, in this case, it is a miracle tree because next verse, every month, not just one month or two months out of the year, every month there will bear fruit. They will bear fruit because the water from the sanctuary flows to them. Their fruit will serve for food and their leaves for healing. Not only is this water going to grow plants that's going to sustain human life forever and ever, it will also heal. The leaves of this tree will heal. What is Ezekiel trying to tell us through this vision? This is what he's saying. One day in the future, sometime, we don't know when, living water will flow from God to the world once again, giving abundant life, and it will be permanent. So this, all this thing I just shared with you is running through John's head as he's writing his biography about Jesus. And the reason we know this is because John is the only one that records this next story, which is about a woman at the well. So John the Apostle, he's a unique apostle because he writes this one biography of Jesus that is unlike the other three. The other three, they have overlapping stories, but John, he has like stories that are not included in the other three. And probably because he was the last to you know, write about this. He's like, I read the other three. Here's some things you guys missed, right? So when John the Apostle is writing this, this biography, like remember, he's not giving us a video footage of what happened. He's painting a picture for us, accentuating certain parts about Jesus' story. And when he does that, he tells a story about a woman at a well in a place called Samaria, which is taboo for Jewish people to walk into because it's where all the compromisers lived, right? And while he's there, he meets this woman at the well by herself in the middle of the day because it was the hottest time of the day and she went there at that time because she wanted to avoid as many people as possible because number one she's a samaritan samaritans and jews don't get along so they're already outcast for being a samaritan but not only that this woman has been married five times five failed marriages the one she's living with right now is not her husband right so in this story like she's also an outcast of her own people like the samaritans don't want her around either and Jesus goes to the well that she's at. And this is a conversation that happens. When a, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, hey, will you give me a drink? And Jesus is definitely fishing here. He's like, he's trying to get something from her. The Samaritan, next verse, the Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? This is not right. Like you're not supposed to be talking to someone like me. I'm an outcast to you Jews. And not only that, I'm an outcast to my own people. And then Jesus says, whoa, 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 whoa. Jesus answered, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is asking you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. So John is clearly thinking about all the imageries of living water in the Old Testament, right? Well, what does he mean by this? Well, he says this, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. You drink from this well, yeah, you'll, you'll be satisfying for a while, but you're going to be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Jesus is talking figuratively right now. It was first physical, like, yeah, if you drink that well, you're going to be thirsty again. But then he's like, but let me tell you about the water that satisfies all of humanity. He says, indeed, the water I give you, uh, the, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. This water that I'm here to give is the water that's going to fix all of humanity. From the Old Testament until now, people have been thirsting for something that would never satisfy. They, they could never satisfy that thirst. And because of that, they hurt each other. They took advantage of other people. They took things without considering what it might do to the other person. All because of thirst. 
and that age is going to come to an end, and he says, I am that source. And they're like, wait a minute, Jesus, we're supposed to drink from you? Well, like, what does that mean? That sounds weird. As a matter of fact, in John chapter 7, he gives an even weirder verse. He says this. He says, let anyone who is thirsty come and drink. Come to me and drink. Like, what? Like, drink your sweat? Like, what are you talking about? Like, like what are we, what do you mean? Like, like, we would hear Jesus say, drink from me. And we're like, what? That must be symbolic, right, Jesus? He's like, yes, it is symbolic. But he's actually making a reference to all the Old Testament passages. So this leads us back to the verse that we started with. At the cross, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. Now, John is inserting in here some details to help us think back to the Old Testament. Okay, like for example, they pierced his side and water poured out. He's talking about Ezekiel here. From the side of the temple came trickles of water, and you know it, it flowed out, right? And another imagery here is that in the Jewish culture, the word for tree in the Hebrew is exactly the same as the word for wood. So when Jesus is hanging from a tree, and water is pouring out of it, he's used, he's trying to call us back to the Genesis imagery, where we're like, oh yeah, remember that story of the the, the tree of life? Like remember that story? Like he's calling us back to that. Remember that story of when Moses goes into the desert and everybody, all the Israelites are thirsty? So he, God says, go to, the, go to the rock and strike the rock and water will come out, living water will come out. Well, guess what happened to Jesus? He was struck down and he was stabbed and water started pouring out. John is including all these little details in this story to help us recall all the times in the Old Testament that we're like, oh yeah, I remember that story. That's, oh, so Jesus is claiming that he is the, the source of the living water. Jesus' sacrifice is now the source of living water, and whoever comes to him will have everlasting life. This is what John is saying here. Jesus is the source that gives life to all the world. He is that satisfying being that's going to bring peace to this world, who's going to bring heaven on earth. But wait a minute, class, you might be saying. I remember that in the book of Ezekiel, it says that it started off as a trickle, but they eventually became ankle deep and then knee deep then waist deep and eventually it was such a big river that you couldn't even cross it anymore. Why didn't John say that, you know, blood poured out but also like a river started pouring out from his side, right? Why didn't he say that, right? And well, maybe, maybe John forgot to insert that bit of information. What about the whole thing about trees growing and, and the fruit that lasts all year round and the, the, the leaves that brings healing? What about that? How come John didn't include that? Well, it turns out he does, but not in this edition of his story. In his sequel, the book of Revelation, John wrote the book of Revelation. In the very last chapter of the book of Revelation, when John is getting, he's also getting like a tour from a tour guide of what heaven looks like, and he uses a lot of imagery here. This angel who's a tour guide takes him to heaven, and then he looks at the city, and he says this, then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb, and the Lamb is code for Jesus, the Lamb that was slain. He's like, do you want to know what happens to that river that Jesus started pouring out, that, that little stream that Jesus poured out when he died on the cross? Well, in the future, when this whole thing is over, there is a river that pours straight from the Lamb, from Jesus. And you wanna know what happens to this river? On each side of the river stood the tree of life. There's, it's not just any tree that's popping up. It's the tree of life. But you know in the book of Genesis, the tree of life was the source of the river? It's like, no, 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 no. Jesus is the source of this living water, and he is giving life to the tree of life. Like, this is just crazy, right? And bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. Again, referring to how now this food that sustains us year-round. And the leaves of the trees are for the healing of the nations. The conflict that we have with other countries, conquering one another because of this tree of life, which comes from the water of life, which comes from Jesus, the author of life. There is now peace in all the world. What is John trying to teach us about who Jesus is when he died on the cross? He's saying this, living water will, will be available to you at the end of the story. But that's not the only thing that John is teaching us today. 
he's also saying living water is available to you now because we are living on this side of history where jesus died on the cross and when jesus died on the cross living water started flowing out and now we have access to that water because we have access to jesus and when jesus died three days later just as he predicted he was raised to life and one of the new new testament authors one of the first christian leaders paul the apostle looking back at that story he says guys because we're connected to jesus the very spirit that brought jesus out of the grave and gave him life is the same spirit that you and i have that we have the ability to go to the people around us and bring resurrection to their hopelessness is somebody feeling alone we have the ability to bring life to that relationship we have the power we have the spirit inside of us to bring life to people who don't know they don't they don't have purpose in their lives we have power to bring justice in an unjust world he says the very spirit that raised jesus from the grave is the same spirit that we carry with us wherever we go and this is the easter story according to john it's pretty cool right yeah all right let's pray